All right, we've got the basics down for our rig now. We have the left side of the entire body, we've got the head, we've got the torso, we've got feet, we've got arms and everything like that. But now what we need to do is start t talking about some usability things which will make the rigs easier for the animators to work with. One of the main things that is really important to have on your rig, especially when you've got FK and IK settings and things like that, is matching controls. Matching controls is something that can literally take forever if you don't have set up correctly. If you have an animator who's working with forward kinematics and they need to switch to inverse kinematics, if you don't have a way for them to switch with just a click of a button, it can literally take 10 minutes, 20 minutes, or almost Im be almost impossible for them to line up things correctly. What you're doing is you're making the technology affect their animation decisions. They will make choices for their animation simply because they know it's hard to deal with technologically speaking. They will say, well, I want to have the character grab this cup, but it's in FK mode and if I want to have them on there, then I've got to put it in IK mode and that's going to take me a half hour to set up to do it without it popping. So I'm just not going to do it. I'll come up with something else. And that's not what you want to do. You want to make sure your rig enables the animator, not limits them. I've worked with rigs that have FK and IK matching, and I've worked with rigs that don't. And I can tell you quite honestly that the rigs that don't allow for FK and IK matching make me want to throw the computer through the window. Literally. I want to like climb up to the top floor and just chuck the computer out because it drives me crazy. So how do we go implementing this type of thing into our rigs? Well, the first thing we need to do is look at how we go about matching one object to another, because that's basically what you're doing when you're matching FK to IK, is you're saying, put the IK control over here, or rotate the FK control so it lines up with that. So what we want to do is take a look at what that means to actually match an object to another object. And the first thing we'll look at is the simplest solution, which is matching one object to another object when the two objects are pretty much exactly the same. Basically, they're both just simple transforms. If you go to your example files that come with part 4, you'll see there's a file there called match1. Go ahead and open that up. This is a simple scene where we have two objects, a cube and a sphere. They are basically the same thing. Both are just transforms. And what we want to do is figure out how to match the position of one to the other. Okay, so let's go ahead and translate the sphere over, say, over here. And let's say what we want to do is move the cube to match the position of the sphere. There's a couple ways we can do it using Mel. The easiest of which is to use the getAdder and setAdder commands, since we know we're going to be grabbing the translation attributes. That's the getAdder that we talked about earlier, and setAdder. So what we can do is use getAdder to get the object attribute value. SetAdder will set the object value. Okay. So if we do, for example, get adder p sphere one dot translate x and execute that command, that's going to return a value 1.769693. That's where it is in translate x. But let's say we want to actually use that value. We can also get it into an attribute, kind of like we're doing the expression editor, where you do dollar sign tx for translate x is going to be equal to, and then I use this tick mark here. It's like the tick that's underneath the tilde key. And I'll use it at the beginning of that mail command and at the end. And what that does is that says this entire command right here, execute that, grab the value, and throw it back into this attribute right here. So we can use this translate x value in a couple of ways. For example, we can print with it. Let's go ahead and execute that. And if I type print tx and execute that, you can see we get the result of what that value is. We can also do things like print tx times 2. And that will give us whatever that value would be. So we can use these to do all sorts of fun things. For example, we can use it in a set adder command. Set adder p cube one dot tx is equal to the translate x value. That variable. Oops, we don't use that equal sign, sorry. And that'll just set it right there. So now the cube and the sphere line up in translate x. Let's go ahead and move the sphere somewhere else and execute the command again and see what happens. And it keeps lining up. No matter how often we do it, 
it'll line up with that because we're always saying grab the current value of the translate x, shove it into this variable trans or tx, and then set the cube attribute translate x to that value. But what if we want to match the position for all three translation axes? We could write three get adder and set adder commands where we'd say get adder translate x, get adder translate y, get adder translate z, but that's a little bit long and frustrating. Luckily, the translation values are stored in something called a float array which means they're actually automatically grouped into three values. So I, if I said get at our psphere translate and just execute this little bit, look at the results we get. We get all three values right there. So I could say t is equal to get at our psphere one dot translate and that will return all three values for me. So then I could do set at our pcube one t, right? If I execute this, I get an error. It says error reading data element number one. That's because Mel doesn't really understand how to use floats like this in a set adder command. What you have to do is specify which indices the t variables you want go where. What? <laughs> so remember I said the translate attribute is considered an array? That means it's actually an entire set of values, three, va uh, three values. And what you can do with this dot, with this uh, t variable now is actually specify those individual values. For example, print t, and I'm going to do bracket 0. This means it's the first value. We're in the computer world, so 0 is 1. And that will return the first value in this array of 3 that come back. So 2.506787, that's the first one. What if I want the third one? Then I will use t bracket 2. And that will return that third value. So what that means is in here, if I do t bracket 0, t bracket 1, and t bracket 2, and use the set adder that way, make sure to change this p cube to p cube t. Now it'll set that value automatically. So we can move this over here, grab those three, Use the set adder command, and bam, and it pops it right over. We can do the same thing with rotation. Let's go ahead and take the sphere, translate it somewhere else, and rotate it as well. Something like that. So we'll copy this, paste it down here, and instead of T, we're going to use R. We'll grab rotate. and then p cube rotate, r, r, r. Now if we execute all these, notice it takes the cube and it moves it over the location of the sphere and then it rotates it as well. So now we know how to match two objects when they're in the same hierarchy. Pretty easy, you just use the get adder commands. But what happens if the objects are in different hierarchies? Will this method still work? So let's try matching different hierarchies by opening up match version 2 and you can see that this file is very similar to the last one. It's got a cube, it's also got a sphere, but the sphere is underneath a different node. It's underneath a different group entirely. So let's see what happens. Let's go ahead and move psphere 1 off to the side by, select it, by selecting the psphere itself and moving it. Now let's grab the same get adder commands that we used earlier and execute those. You'll see that it works. It moves the sphere over, or moves the cube over to the sphere just like we're expecting it to. But what happens if we move the group instead of the sphere? So we'll select the group like that and move it here. Now let's execute the commands in the script editor. Notice nothing happens. Why didn't it move? Well, it didn't move because we're using the get adder command to grab the values of the translate attribute for the sphere. <coughs> when we move the group above the sphere, the sphere's own translation values don't change at all, even though the sphere is in a different place in world space. Notice the spheres translate x, y, and z are this value, and the cubes translate x, y, and z are exactly the same value. But because the group itself is moved, the sphere appears differently. So the command is doing exactly what we're asking it to, but it's not doing what we want. What we want is it to grab the value of the world space position of the sphere and set the cube to that value. So how do we use the world space position? Well, getAdder isn't going to do it for us. Instead, we have to use a command called xform.